Uh, so thanks, thanks guys very much for um, for having me. Uh, so let me share my screen here. Um, so this is joint work with uh, with Stefano Giglio, um, who's at Yale, um, and this is kind of a continuation of of a bunch of work that we've done with um, with thinking about implied volatilities with options and with their link to um, to the real economy. And so very much what we're trying to understand is how how these implied volatilities, in particular on individual stocks, link up to what's going on in the aggregate economy. So there are, um, you know, as I, as I think probably everybody uh, in this seminar knows, there are these large literatures, not just in finance. So in finance, it's like, you know, especially in derivatives, understanding the dynamics of volatility itself, understanding implied volatilities is obviously a, you know, a central area, like if not like the most important area of like derivatives pricing and a major driver of derivatives prices. But we also care about uncertainty and volatility in macro and micro, right? So they are big drivers of, um, of a lot of recent models. People with coronavirus talk about, you know, maybe the reason or maybe one potential channel for how this could affect the economy is that firms don't know whether to invest, they don't know whether to hire because they don't know what's going to happen in the near future. And so, you know, if you want to ask those, if you want to answer whether if you want to know what the effects of shocks to uncertainty are, you need to obviously have a, a measure of uncertainty. So that's really what we're after. We want to try to measure uncertainty and, and in particular measure uncertainty in the cross section. And I'll talk a lot about, about what we mean by that. And then what we want to know is once we have that, so once we have this measure of, of cross sectional uncertainty, we want to know does that, do these things matter for, for the real economy? So the kinds of models that we're thinking about, so certainly in finance, you have say like portfolio choice models. Uh, you know, when you're thinking about portfolio choice, you obviously care not just about volatility at the aggregate level, not just about like the volatility of the market. You also care about what are the variances and the covariances of individual stocks. When we think about derivatives pricing, you know, any nonlinear function of the underlying, it's the, the, the value of that final payoff is going to depend on the, the variance of the underlying. You certainly might care about other moments, about say higher moments, other functions of the underlying. Uh, and I think that would be an interesting extension to what we're doing. But we're gonna start with just the simplest first step, which is to ask what is the conditional variance um, in particular in the cross section. Now the, the macro models that we're trying to link to are these models in which shocks to uncertainty can affect uh, affect the real economy. So I mean, Bloom has is, is probably like the, the primary driver of the, the more recent resurgence of that field, where he has these models of uh, fixed adjustment costs and investment. And in those models, a firm, when it faces higher uncertainty under certain parameter values, it's going to reduce investment. And so you'll get a recession. There's work with financial friction. So Cristiano Amato and Rostagno and um, Sebastian Detella have work where when you face financial frictions, that can affect, that can cause uncertainty to, to drive the business cycle. You can do this through like search and matching frameworks. There's a lot of ways to make it happen. Um, and, and so, you know, the natural step then is to ask empirically, what do we, what do we know about this? So how well does uncertainty explain what's going on in the, the business cycle? And most past work, my own included, but really like essentially the entire macro literature on looks essentially just at aggregate uncertainty and almost exclusively at the VIX. I'd say like probably 80 to 90 percent of the literature in macro just uses the VIX. And so when they talk about uncertainty then empirically, what they mean is uncertainty about a common shock, right? About what the aggregate economy is doing. But in a lot of the models, what's important is not just the common shock. What matters is actually idiosyncratic shocks. It matters what's going on at the micro level. So for example, how big are, is the dispersion across firms, across households? So in models with fixed adjustment costs and models with precautionary saving demand on the part of households, we're going to care a lot about what's the distribution of shocks across households, across firms. You also might care about average correlations, right? If we're thinking about, again, portfolio choice, that's going to matter. Now, there is some work on measuring that. The, the thing about that work, so there are, you know, the probably the most highly cited paper here, I think it's one of John Campbell's, it might be his most highly cited paper, um, is about measuring the realized volatility of stock returns for individual firms. So that's Campbell, Lechamon, Hill, and Shu. 
And what they do in that paper is they basically just look at squared returns on individual stocks and they subtract out the squared return on the market. And that's giving them then really realized volatility. So the analog to, to market realized vol, they're looking at realized vol for the firm specific component of return. There's a more recent paper by um, Herskovic, Kelly, and Ben Norberg that does something pretty similar and, and it slices things a little more finely. The contribution that we're going to make here is to use a, a relatively long data set that I'll talk about to get option implied cross sectional uncertainty. So, what we want to get is not what is the realized volatility, we want the ex ante expectation of that, right? Because obviously, in a model, that's what's going to matter. What matters is not how volatile the shocks turn out to be, it's how volatile do you think the shocks are? How broad do you think the conditional distribution is? That is the thing that's actually going to, in these models with fixed adjustment costs with precautionary saving effects, that's the thing that's actually going to drive decision making. So to be a little bit more specific about what we're going to do, we can define, we can just say, look, I have the return on stock I for any stock. Roughly, so ideally, I'd like to have a beta in here. We'll talk about why there's no beta. It really doesn't make any difference quantitatively. This is actually what Campbell et al. do. The return on stock I is just the return on the market. So we say the beta is somewhere near one plus an orthogonal shock epsilon I. Then I can say, all right, well, if I want to know the conditional variance for this epsilon, how can I get it? Well, I could take the conditional variance for the entire return on the stock, which I can get from options on stock I and subtract the variance of the return on the market. So I take the variance of this guy minus the variance of the market return, I get the variance of epsilon. And then we're just gonna sum across all the stocks waiting by market cap. So we just wanna get some average measure of this thing. You don't have to wait by market cap, you could look at a median, you can do lots of other things. This is what we're gonna do is just a first pass. And so what we wanna know are one, how does this object, this variance for these epsilons, how does it behave over time? What does it do? Right, so you might think it would look something like the VIX maybe, maybe you think it's cyclical, like there are lots of ideas for what it might do. I just wanna measure it, I wanna see how it's behaved over time. Um, how volatile is it, what is it correlated with? Number two, does it forecast anything? So if you believe that uncertainty shocks are an important driver of the business cycle, then you would think that fluctuations in this object would predict declines in output, increases in unemployment. So do we see that? Do we see forecasting power? And then once we've constructed, once we've measured these things, we've measured the behavior of that variance over time, once we've measured whether it has any forecasting power, we can ask whether the big models that are out there, whether they're consistent with what we see in the data. Now there are some other things you could do. So you could also look at pricing. We could, another thing that you could ask is, all right, I can buy options on this thing. I could construct, say, I could buy a straddle on stock I, sell a straddle on the market. It's essentially a claim on this, the vol realized volatility of this epsilon I. I could ask what are the returns on that. And so we actually did that previously. We we're probably gonna split that off into a separate paper. I'm not gonna talk about that today. But that, you'll see some, you will see some suggestive evidence on what that looks like. So we're gonna look at the Berkeley Options Database, we're gonna look at option metrics, have some data from the CME, from Bloomberg. We put all these together, we get data, we get really a 40 year coverage. We get 1980 up to 2020. The, again, the macro literature on this is never measured cross-sectional uncertainty. The finance literature has thought about this a bit, but I think not, not exactly in the way that we're gonna construct it. Uh, and we'll also show you data uh, for Europe since 2002. What we're gonna find is that in terms of cyclicality, this, so, well, what you're gonna see is that first of all, this, this implied volatility for this epsilon, this guy, so I'm gonna call it cross-sectional uncertainty, does not, from the first 20 years of the sample, has very, very little variation. It is nearly constant. I was stunned at how flat this object is. So it's very, very stable for a long time, and it turns out to have a pretty mixed link with the business cycle. It does not have a clear positive or negative correlation with the state of the economy. We're going to look at some models. The two major models that we're going to look at, which I think are the leading models in this area, are both going to be inconsistent with different aspects of the data. This is going to suggest that um, there are things that we need to do to improve those models. But really what I want to focus on, again, is it's essentially the time series of this object and what does it look like. So I think it's, it's objectively interesting on its own. 
Um, last, in terms of the literature, just very briefly, um, so we're thinking about this work by Nick Bloom, by Cristiano Mano Rostano, uh, and some other important macro papers. There's micro type work that tries to understand the effects of these shocks. Uh, so, like, Buley is one of the big names here, Kaplan and Violante. And then again, in terms of measurement, we have I think, you know, from a finance perspective, we have papers on option pricing at the firm level. There's not a ton, there's not nearly as much as what we have for the S&P 500, but it does exist. Um, and then, you know, people have looked at IVs on individual firms, they've looked at volatility risk premium. What we're trying to do is strip out the market part of that and get just purely the firm specific part and then average that across the entire market to the extent that we can. Uh, so what I'm gonna do then is talk about the data, look at how it's behaved in the time series, look at, at its cyclicality, look at how it's, um, its ability to forecast things, and then last, um, look at the ability of this thing to, to look at the ability of the models that we have out there to fit what we see in the data. Um, and so I'm gonna like, pause here in case there are any questions so far. So, so there aren't any questions in the chat, so yeah, but I have one. Yeah. So, I gather since you're using the Berkeley options database that your option implied volatilities are going to be for short horizon options. Right. These are going to be 30 day IVs. Yeah. And volatility is mean reverting. So it's, you know, it's not that stock return volatility is not that persistent. So is this volatility you're measuring? Does it map well to the volatilities in the model in the models? Um, so what I would say is that at the end of the day, this is the, you know, the fact that these volatilities are not very persistent tells you something about the models, right? It's, so it's true that, so in one of the models that we're going to look at, the persistence actually is very close to what we see in the data. In the other one, the persistence is going to be a good deal higher. Our argument would be that, you know, the problem is not in the data, it's in the model, right? It's in their calibration. Like it, what we observe in the data is, as you say, that volatility is not, just not that persistent. And, you know, we don't see, we don't really see terribly long medium, we don't see very big medium frequency fluctuations. We don't see very big low frequency fluctuations. It's actually kind of amazing how stable all these volatility processes are uh, at low frequencies. That it's not like you see like big swings over time. And the models, you know, the models should be consistent with that. Or at the very least, if they're not going to be consistent with that, you would hope that they, like, you know, they need to come up with some excuse for why, why, they, why there would be a, a broken link between stock return volatility and the volatility of the underlying shocks. All right, thanks. Ian, this is Seng. I have a quick question. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, the existence of beta really does not matter in your equation. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because if we don't have beta, isn't it the case that this idiosyncratic shock might capture some parts of uh, systematic fluctuation? Yes, so let me, um, I'm gonna show you, that's gonna be like one or two slides from now. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk uh, to you later. Yeah, okay. so I'm gonna talk through that. Um, and we have, I, what I can say is that in the paper, we just we do measure. We go we go ahead and actually measure beta and correct everything for beta. Um, we're not currently doing it as the benchmark, just because I uh, I kind of like that this is simpler. But um, when we actually correct for it, it ends up not um, not having a large empirical effect. Okay, before you go on, there is a question from. Oh, did I interrupt you, Sung? I'm sorry. No. Okay. So yeah, before yeah. we go on, there is a question in the chat. Um, so from Amit Gayal, maybe you get into this later, but you mentioned that IV is flat. I think he means approximately constant for 1980 through 2000, but we know that realized volatility increased over that period. What does this imply for the variance risk premium during that period? So, uh, so I'll show you realized volatility. And over this period, when you wait by market cap or when you just look at big firms, realized volatility actually doesn't go up. Um, it's that, that increase in realized volatility is, so if you look at like, if you look at the Herskovic, Herskovic at all results, that increase is really concentrated in the, the bottom deciles. And 
inevitably, you know, especially in the early part of our data, we have to, we, you know, we really, you only had options for relatively large firms and for the large firms, you don't see that increase. So can I, can I also jump in with a question? This is Torben. Yeah. So uh, just the consensus that seems to emerge between you, Ian, and, uh, and Neil, uh, I don't know if I buy that there's not that much variation or persistence in volatility. It's, it's true, if you get a huge shock, a lot of it mean reverts pretty quickly, but you have years where the VIX or volatility is 10, 11% or 9% annual, and other times where for years it circles around 20% or more. So you have variations of 50 or 100% in the level for years on average. Uh, yeah. so now these long-term variations that are pretty dramatic. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. It's not an uncontroversial point. It's just how you view it in terms of high frequency and low frequency dynamics a little bit. Um, no, so that's, uh, so Torben is, I, Torben is my colleague. I actually haven't talked to Torben in a while. So Torben, it's good to hear from you. Um, Same here, by the way. Good to hear you. <laughs> uh, so the, um, it's funny, I think part of what's going on here, so I'm, look, I'm just gonna, you're gonna see it, you're gonna see the graphs, and that I think will help resolve a lot of this. Uh, I totally agree with what you're saying, Torben, that like you see, you know, a few years where it's high and a few years where it's low. Um, I guess all I mean is that like, by in terms of like an absence of really low frequency stuff, that like if you look at like the price dividend ratio, you see these like, you know, 50 year swings in the price dividend ratio. And we don't, it, it, the VIX seems to be more dominated by a lot of higher frequency variation. But I don't wanna, you know, there's the literature on fractional integration, which you, you know, you have some recent stuff on that that I'm, I'm well aware of. And so I'm just gonna plot it and, you know, we'll look at it and, uh, and, and we can go from there. Certainly what I can say is that, um, you know, in the, the, the models are nowhere near as rich as what you see in the data. So then the question is what aspect of the data do you want the model to match? And we're just gonna kind of report some stuff and like give people this data. And uh, when they calibrate their model, they now have the thing that they actually need. And I don't think they've had the, you need this, this conditional measure. And uh, like, if you, wanna, if you wanna think about a model of uncertainty shocks, you need a measure of uncertainty. And my claim would be that we really haven't had that when we're thinking about idiosyncratic shocks. What we've had has only been the, the realization of the shocks. And I'm gonna show you that that does not look the same as the, the conditional variance. All right, we've gotta let you move on. Okay, good. So, um, I mean, those, the, those questions were all like, you know, exactly what I wanna talk about. So, so what is our data? So the data that we have is uh, the really the novel piece of data is between 1980 and, and 1995. We have data from the Berkeley Option Database. The Berkeley Option Database is nice because this is tick level data. This is just every single bid, offer, and trade that went through the CBOE over that period. Um, that data had actually disappeared. So Berkeley stopped selling it in the mid 90s. Um, the way we got it was we found this guy, Stuart Mayhew, who is a, he's a PhD economist from Berkeley. He's now at Cornerstone, I believe. He had been carrying magnetic tapes with his data uh, between like, I think five different jobs in five different cities over the last like 25 years. Um, and he was the last, as far as I can tell, he was the only person that still had the data, that had the full, full sample of everything. So we got it, he sent it to Terry Hendershot in the Berkeley Library. They digitized everything, and um, Terry, I, can't, I actually don't know whether Terry will currently send it to you. There were some legal questions. As far as I can tell, we, I don't know if we're grandfathered in or what, but nobody's told us to stop using it. It's about 10 gigabytes in a zip file. Um, so you can email Terry and potentially try to get it if you're interested in working with it, because what's cool about it is that, you know, it's 15 years of data that, is added on top of the 25 that we get from option metrics. And so it's a pretty substantial increase in the, the length of your time series. Again, it's everything that was trading and it gets you three extra recessions that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And so if you care about the business cycle, this is, this is very valuable. So we use option metrics from 96 to 2019. They cut out in June of last year. Since then, uh, we have a script that calculates everything that we need in Bloomberg over the last 12 months. And so that'll get us we redid it just like about a week ago, so it gets us right up, um, basically right up to present. In terms of data coverage, what we have, what I'm plotting here is the fraction of the total crisp market cap that's covered by our data. 
So when we have the Berkeley data, you have to do some work. You have to match the tickers by hand back into CRISP. It's a bit of a pain. But once you do that um, with a decent amount of effort, we can get a, a coverage of about a third of total market cap. Now, a third is going to be big if it's a random sample. It's not going to be that big if it's selected. As far as we can tell, this looks like a fairly random sample. If you look at industry composition in particular, the industry composition of the data in this period looks essentially the same as the industry composition of the overall market. We've actually gone back and adjusted everything to have fixed industry composition that like to make it sure that it matches, everything looks fine. Certainly this is tilted towards the biggest stocks. There's absolutely no question about that. So we're gonna have the largest firms. We're then gonna wait by market cap. And so inevitably then we're focusing on what are the what are the implied vials for the very largest firms. Um, and so everything that you see here, I want you to be thinking about that. This is not market cap, these are not micro caps. And in addition to that, you know, remember when I talk about uncertainty here, we're talking about publicly traded firms. And so there are lots and lots of firms that are not publicly traded that are gonna be much, much smaller. You could easily think of a model where those matter. So we're not, that's, that's not what we're gonna be measuring here. Once we get out of the Berkeley database and get into option metrics, you jump up to having coverage of about two thirds of firms, you get all the way up to like, I think it's 97% by the very end. Um, what's going on here is that SIBO uh, does not cover the whole market. Option metrics also gets like Philadelphia and like Amex and, and I think uh, Pacific Exchange. And there's some migration of firms over time. So we get more and more coverage as we go until we have essentially the entire market. What we're going to calculate is at the money ID. But the reason we do that is that if you want it, you could do the VIX calculation, right? And, and with modern data, modern markets, you can do that for individual firms. The problem with that is that in the early 80s, really all throughout the 80s, you don't have enough strikes. What was going on was that the total market liquidity back in the 80s was a lot smaller. The way they dealt with that was by having far fewer contracts than we have now. So each individual contract was actually still rather liquid. If you go look at like volume, number of trades, paid ask spreads, things like that, you still are getting a lot of liquidity. It's just that what they did was they would have like four strikes. Like literally, you go look at IBM in 1980, you go into the newspaper and you can see it, you'll see literally four strikes at say like three different maturities. So you have 12 total options to trade or 24 if you throw in both puts and calls. Whereas now, you know, you have dozens and dozens of strikes, you have all sorts of maturities, monthly maturities, weekly maturities. Since you don't have that many strikes, you can't, you can't do the VIX. So we just stick to have the money IV. For our purposes, that's gonna be fine. Um, if you just look at the, in terms of like raw correlations, they're over 99% correlated with like, if you look at S&P 500, model free implied vol versus at the money implied vol, month to month, they're 99% correlated. At higher frequency, like daily frequency, minute by minute, they're not perfectly correlated. And if you really care about the level, if you want to think about measuring the variance risk premium, then, then that difference does start to really matter. But for our purposes, for just knowing when it's high versus low, at the money IV is going to be enough. For option metrics, we just use the surface file, so they calculate IV for us. Um, for a Berkeley option database, we'll get it from using black chunks. So we'll just calculate it on our own. We ignore early exercise, we've checked whether it matters and it does not appear to make a difference. So this is where I'm gonna, where, where I can talk about the data. So again, literally what we're doing is we're saying, all right, I have a standard market model. So the return on stock I is beta times the return on the market plus epsilon. I can then take variances of both sides and weight them by market cap. So what do I get? The, Valuated average variance across the stocks, so call that total firm uncertainty, is going to be this valuated sum of the beta squared, beta squared, should actually be a t minus one, valuated sum of these squared betas times the market volatility plus that firm specific piece. So saying this is where I can, we can, you know, really talk about exactly what it is that we're missing. What we're missing is this value-weighted cross-sectional variance of the betas. So to the extent that we'll have a bias, it's going to come from this thing being non-zero and this thing potentially changing over time. We can go measure it in the data. And so we've just done that. We've done it with rolling betas, we've done it with fixed betas where the weights are moving. It has, the effect is, not, is absolutely not zero. I certainly don't wanna say that like, there's no impact of, um, of putting the betas in there. 
it's not quantitatively that big. It's a little, it's probably smaller than I would have expected. Um, the other reason we do this, the reason we're going to drop the betas, I'm just going to ignore this term, is again that Campbell and I'll do it. And so we want to kind of follow what they're doing nice and closely and just say, look, the only distinction between us and them is that we're using option implied volatilities as opposed to using realized variance. And then we're going to look at the dynamics of this object over time. So the thing that we care about is this firm specific IV. It's this third part. Again, we're waiting by market cap. We're tilting towards big firms. We're ignoring the betas. All of these are approximations. None of this is right. Right? First of all, these are at the money IVs. And so they're going to be wrong to the extent the Black Scholes model is wrong. Second of all, these are asset prices. So they're going to have risk premium built in. There's going to be a variance risk premium living inside of this. Third, there's measurement error, right? These prices are not, are not observed without error. And so all of these things are going to potentially create a gap. Like there's absolutely no claim here that we have an errorless measure of uncertainty. But I think this is what you're going to see is that this is going to be pretty useful for measuring, for actually forecasting realized volatility. And I think it's probably about the best we can do in terms of measuring, kind of getting a nice, clean, and direct and simple measure of, of this firm specific uncertainty. And so we can do two things. One, we're gonna, so I'm gonna call it sigma squared epsilon. That's gonna be this, this, it's gonna be this thing. It's the variance of these epsilons. Where we get that again is the sigma squared i, firm, firm implied variance minus market variance. And then there's a realized version of that, realized analog to it, right? Which is just like doing realized volatility. It's the cross-sectional realized volatility on individual stocks minus the realized volatility on the market. I'll call that realized dispersion, right? Because it's how broad was the distribution of the firm specific returns in, in a given period. That's what Campbell et al. studied. And something that I think is important to emphasize about that is that this is not completely idiosyncratic, right? I don't, these epsilons are not things that only affect one firm. They can be sector shocks, they can be location shocks, they can be customer shocks, supplier shocks. They can be things that affect multiple firms. They're just things that have to wash out in the end. And so I want to refer to this as cross-sectional uncertainty. That's the term that I'm going to try to be careful about using. We can strip out industry components. We've done that. It does have some effects. I'll talk about where it affects things. Um, you, can see that, see, you can see that in the paper if you go look at the paper. Now, the, the last thing I want to note about this is suppose you think our data is just trash. Like it's just no good. You think the Berkeley database is a mess. Suppose like the, the tapes are corrupted. Maybe it's all fake. Suppose it's none of it's any good. The bid ask spreads are wide. There's a million reasons why it might not be any good. Suppose it was no good, what would we get? This would be noise. Our implied volatility for these individual firms would be noise. And what I would expect then is a strong negative correlation between my cross-sectional uncertainty and my market uncertainty. And so the test here of whether this is all junk is not for the sigma squared epsilon to be junk, right? I would not expect this to look like white noise. If my firm options are white noise, I'm going to get a negative relationship between market volatility and cross-sectional volatility. And so we can check for that in the data. Um, so let me take any questions. So let me just pause here and take any questions about just about this like basic setup and about what we're measuring. Okay, there aren't any questions in the chat right now, but if someone wants to use their mic. So I do see David Bates. So David asked about um about correlation risk. Uh, oh. And so that, um, so that's right. You're, so you're absolutely right. I meant to, to add, add this citation to what they're doing. Now, like, absolutely, what we are doing has implications for, for correlation. Um, you know, when, you, when you're thinking about correlation, the, essentially, the issue starts to become how you want to think about um, what are the fundamental shocks? And so essentially, like you have, you have two things here. There are basically two degrees of freedom. So we have the variance of the market return, the variance of the epsilon. The correlation is going to be a function of those two variances. Um, and so then, and so everything that we're doing is going to have implications for the correlation. Uh, and so then Chris asked about, um, he said beta doesn't matter because it's lagged. And so given what we're doing is just descriptive, we could use contemporaneous beta. And so that's right. So we've done that. We've calculated a, um, a rolling, we've done, a, a, I think, essentially what you're suggesting, which is to calculate a rolling beta um, 
and the results do come out very, very close. And so it's so, you know, I think the fact that a couple of people have asked about this suggests that possibly the correct thing is to just make that the main specification. And um, and I think the results are going to, well, we have checked this, and the results do come out essentially the same. Um, so is there anything else about, about the measurement? Okay, good. So let me, um, in that case, show you the data. So this is our cross-sectional ID. This is that conditional standard deviation for the epsilons. So it's again, it's the, it's the take average firm level implied volatility, subtract market implied volatility, this is what you get. The gray bars are NBER dated recessions. The y-axis is in terms of annualized standard deviation units. So it's like the units of the VIX. What you can see is this thing between 1980 and roughly 1998 does not fluctuate a whole lot. It moves between 0.2 and 0.3. If you're somebody who has looked at the VIX a whole lot, you'll recognize that these are very small fluctuations compared to what the VIX does. I'm gonna show you that in just a moment. We then have a huge spike in the late 90s before the market crashes, long before the market crashes. And this is essentially when you're in the, the tech bubble and everything was getting very, very volatile. Then as the market declines, cross-sectional uncertainty comes back down. It's very low in the early 2000s, jumps up in the financial crisis, jumps up with coronavirus. It's actually come back down since then. So if you look today, it's, it's, you can see it's already substantially lower. Outside of those three events, there are not very large fluctuations. Now, to get a sense of why that, why it's so, to me, this is surprising. It's surprising to me that this thing is so flat for so long with just these three, three big peaks. And the reason it's surprising is this graph. This graph is, this, there's, a lot, there's a lot on this graph, um, but I kind of like this graph for having a lot on it. So we did a couple of things in this graph. Um, we we're taking logs now, so we're on a log scale. You can see that on the axes. And the point of that is just to get everything, get the fluctuations in relative terms. And the gray line here is now S&P 500 implied volatility. So it's at the money IV. It's almost identical to the VIX, but not absolutely identical. What you can see here is that the movements in S&P 500 implied volatility are just far, far larger than the movements in cross-sectional uncertainty. So for example, during the financial crisis, implied volatility for the S&P 500 rose by more than a factor of four. Implied volatility in the cross section rose by about a factor of two. We see large fluctuations in other periods. So the debt ceiling debates, the Euro crisis in um, 2010 and 2011, those were big increases in market level implied volatility. We see essentially nothing in the cross section. Black Monday in 1987, huge increase in S&P 500 implied volatility, you do get a movement, but not much in the cross section. Same goes with the first Gulf War, Asian financial crisis, big jump up in the S&P 500, nothing in the cross section. Second Gulf War, 9-11, same story. And so what's interesting here is that a lot of these, these moments that we think of as having very high uncertainty, these periods of high uncertainty, even coronavirus, they're very often dominated by uncertainty about the overall market rather than uncertainty about uh, the cross-section, about the firm-specific component of shocks. And so that's the sense in which when I say this series is flat, what I mean is that it's flat relative to what's going on in the broader market. To quantify that a little bit further, one way to do it is just to look at the volatility of these two these two series of the S&P 500 volatility and, um, and the epsilons relative to their mean. In the full sample, the volatility for the S&P 500 relative to its mean is 0.4. For the uh, epsilons, it's 0.29. In the first half of the sample, it was 0.3 for the S&P and only 0.09. So the standard deviation is about 10% of the mean in the, the first half of the sample. In the second half, they both go up to closer to 40%. And so you can see that, right? That subsequent to 1998, this cross-sectional uncertainty has been a lot more volatile. But for the first 18 years of the sample, for the first three recessions, you don't see anything. And 
they're positively correlated. You would not get if this was just noise. So we get, we get a correlation of 0.49 that's really coming from a couple big events, right? It's coming from three, these three big events. Outside of those big, huge movements, there's not a very strong relationship. And again, a lot of these big macro events that translate into big increases in the VIX do not translate into high cross-sectional uncertainty. Um, you know, that may or may not be surprising to you. I think there's, you know, from one perspective, you could say, look, 9-11 was, was just an, it was, it was an aggregate shock. It's this shock right here. See a little spike in the cross-section, but this was essentially just everything's worse. The whole economy's worse. The debt ceiling is about what the U.S. government's going to do. Can it, pay, can it pay its debts? And it's not clear that that should have huge effects um, on the cross-section. The financial crisis apparently was different. That was something where investors were expecting that to have very different effects on different firms. Now we can use this to get a variance decomposition for the total uncertainty that individual firms face. Now, so that's really the bottom here. So the, this is the variance of uncertainty. The variance of the total uncertainty that firms face has really three components. The variance of the market uncertainty, the common component, the variance of the cross-sectional uncertainty, and then the covariance between the two. And it turns out it's essentially equally split between those three terms. Fluctuations in the, the uncertainty that individual firms face, one third of them, or on some level, half of them, are from a common shock, half are from some sort of cross-sectional shock, whether it's a sector shock or a firm shock or a location shock, and then the remainder is the correlation between the two. So it's kind of 50-50 between these two pieces. Um, so are there any questions about, about this basic, this basic time series? So there is um, one question in the chat if you yeah. see it. Right. So these, so these units are going to be low because we're using half the money applied vol instead of the VIX. So the VIX is going to be systematically higher than, um, than the black shoals applied volatility. Okay, good. Um, is there, is there anything else about that? Okay, so um, so now to this question about realized volatility. Um, so actually, so I mean, we can also, you know, looking at this graph, you know, this is, again, kind of going back to Torben's point and the Neil's point a bit. Um, I mean, this is the, this is kind of the source of my claim that, I mean, you can, you know, we can go back and forth on what constitutes low versus high frequency here, right? In the sense that I think for a certain type of researcher, this period in the late 90s counts as low frequency in the sense that, you know, cross-sectional uncertainty was elevated for say like four or five years. Um, I think for, from the perspective of a macro model, when they're talking about these business cycle frequencies, that's not, they would think of that as like kind of not high, high frequency, but just kind of, they would think of that as like business cycle are actually faster, right? That like a business, an entire business cycle is from here to here. And so they're thinking about relatively long periods, like up to 10 years. So you see that again, say in the last 10 years. Um, and so these are, I like, for a certain audience, this would still count as a relatively high frequency fluctuation. And then at low frequencies, you know, in 2015, the cross-sectional implied volatility is not that different from what it was in 1985. Like 30 years earlier, you're still around 0.2. Looks maybe a little different, you know. I wouldn't maybe put too much weight in that, just given uh, given the changes in the sample over time and things like that. Now, um, I think it was Ahmed's question about realized realized volatility. So that's what's what I'm plotting in gray here. So gray here is the re is is realized volatility weighted by market cap. So this is going to be tilting towards the biggest stocks. Um, that has not been trending up substantially over time. And it's certainly the case that we, so Campbell, Etau, Malkiel, and Chu, their data I think only went up to about 1992, so they didn't have too much to say about this, this whole period. First of it all do go much further, and they do see an upward trend. And again, that trend is due to the smallest firms. Um, they, they slice by decile, and it's like most of the smaller deciles driving. We don't see a big trend. What you see is that this, the, you know, not at all surprisingly, the cross-sectional IV looks a lot like realized volatility, and it should, right? This is exactly what you want. Um, 
Now the question, if you really want to know, is this implied volatility a measure of uncertainty is whether it has forecasting power. You should ignore this. This is wrong. So we have some stuff about the variance risk premium. We had it. It's, I'm not going to talk about it today. At the money IVs, don't tell you, don't tell you what that is. So forget about that comment. So what we're going to do is I want to know, does my sigma epsilon, does this cross-sectional implied volatility, does it forecast realized dispersion? So this is a option implied measure. So it's going to be the Q expectation of this realized cross-sectional dispersion. And I can ask, is it a good forecaster? So I'm just going to run a regression. Regress realized dispersion, cross-sectional variance of returns. Regress that on lagged realized dispersion, lagged cross-sectional implied volatility. What do we get? The coefficient on lagged realized dispersion is 0.23. It's only marginally significant at the 10% level. The coefficient on lagged implied volatility is 0.7, and it's highly significant. Essentially, what this is saying is that to a first order, the sigma epsilon, this implied volatility, is a sufficient statistic for cross-sectional return volatility. It's essentially, not entirely, but very nearly driving realized dispersion out of this, driving lagged realized dispersion out of this regression. And so that says then that this is actually a measure of uncertainty. This is, this is measuring pretty well what is the conditional variance? What, is you, what should your expectation be for what the distribution of returns is going to be in the next period? And so in that sense, then, I can look at this sigma epsilon, can look at this graph, this guy. I can take this as an actual measure of uncertainty because that's what this thing is doing. It does actually forecast what is the realized variance going forward. Um, the coefficient is less than one, so that, you know, maybe there's something going on with risk premium. If we want to check that, we'd have to drop that guy out. Um, you could ask about that. I think the risk premium would be in the key. So given that, given that I know that this does forecast realized dispersion, then the next question I want to ask is, what does this have to do with the rest of the economy? Does a thing that forecasts uncertainty at the firm level, does it tell me anything about unemployment, recessions, future growth? So that's what we want to move to. We want to think about forecasts. So the first thing that we could do is look at how this relates to the level of the overall stock market. The gray line here now is the, uh, basically it's the total return on the, it's the crisp valuated index minus a linear trend. So it's just where is the crisp relative to its, um, to its long run average. This is just tilting the line down so it's flat over the full sample. The first big spike in cross-sectional uncertainty comes when uh, the market is actually doing well. Cross-sectional uncertainty rises while the market is hitting its peak. It's right at the end. And so, you know, I think a lot of people would take that as an indicator of the bubble. And uncertainty falls as the price comes back down. They fall really essentially in sync. They peak in almost the exact same month. It's offset by, I think, three months. The market comes down and so does cross-sectional uncertainty. You get a little bump here at the end. Cross-sectional uncertainty flattens out. The next time it goes up is when the market is coming down. The market crashes in 2007. Cross-sectional uncertainty jumps up exactly as the market's falling. So this looks like exactly the opposite pattern from what you see in that first episode. These aren't the same thing. You would not expect, I don't think you would want a single model to be simultaneously explaining both of these. The market then recovers, uncertainty stays low, then uh, back in March, cross-sectional uncertainty spikes, the market crashes, market comes back up, uncertainty goes back down. So these last two episodes look very similar. They look very different from the first episode. We first wrote this paper back here. The paper was easier to write back then because then we just had two episodes and everything was nicely balanced. And now it's two to one and it makes our story a little bit messy. You go back before 98, again, you don't see a whole heck of a lot. You don't see anything of the magnitude of these later fluctuations. Um, so the market falls a lot in 1990, you get a little bump up, it's not huge. 1987, the market falls, a bump up, again, it's not huge. And so these are, basically this is kind of the first way to see that what we're gonna argue is that there's just really not a consistent, um, consistent relationship between the two. Unlike the VIX, where you know every time the market goes down, the VIX goes up, just like unquestionably. If you care about macro, 
You might care more about links, not just to what the stock market is doing, where things are going to be a little mechanical, but also links to uh, measures of real activity. So this is the unemployment rate now in gray. The first three recessions in here, when the unemployment rate goes up, you don't see a lot of action. Unemployment is low in 2000, exactly at the same time that cross-sectional uncertainty is peaking. As uncertainty rises, or as uncertainty falls, unemployment rises. You get the opposite in the financial crisis, the opposite with coronavirus. It's a little hard to see this, but uh, unemployment you know, peaked at just short of 15% um, back in, uh, I think that was in April. This is investment, same story. Investment was high in the late 90s when uncertainty is high. It's low in 2009 when uncertainty is high. So we can look at correlations. Um, if we just look at raw correlations over the full sample of cross-sectional uncertainty with IP, with employment, with the unemployment rate, with capacity utilization, you don't see much. They're kind of mixed. And in fact, they all change sign pre and post-1998, all four of these measures of the level of the economy. When we look at growth rates, things start to become a little bit clearer in the sense that in terms of growth rates, high growth rates for the economy are associated with declines in, um, or associated with, with low uncertainty. So high IP, sorry, high IP gets me, um, high IP growth is associated with low uncertainty, high employment growth, declines in unemployment, and, um, you know, being in a boom. And that's true both in the first and second halves of the cycle. Um, so there are there, let me just pause for a moment here. Are there any questions about, so I'm kind of going a little fast. Are there any questions about, uh, just about these raw correlations and about this time series or about the realized volatility about this guy? So Christian here, I was about to write a very lengthy one, so I'll just ask it. Yeah. Uh, so you had this pattern about the market cap at the beginning, right? The, the, the Berkeley database covered about 30% of the total market cap. I, yeah. I would imagine these were relatively large firms, right? Correct, yes. And then you add another 40% of the total market cap by including, you know, large but smaller firms in the sample, right? So I don't actually, so there, uh, there's two answers to that question. So the first is that I don't actually think that that's what happened. So... In 19, there are two things that happened um, in 1995. So one is that when you switch to option metrics, they're getting more um, exchanges. So everybody, at that point, there were options traded on a bunch of different exchanges. And uh, so, you, so SIBO got some of the big firms, they didn't get all the big firms. Option metrics is getting data from all those different exchanges. And so we're getting still kind of, we're still tilted towards big stocks. We just now have all the big stocks instead of a sample of the big stocks. I see, I see. So you don't think that some of the patterns that are kind of pre-96 uh, versus post-96 could be due to size? No, because the other thing that we do, so I didn't mention this, um, the other thing that we do is this actually restricts to just the 200 largest firms. Okay, I see. Well, we're looking at option metrics. The reason we did that is because in the Berkeley data, what we matched by hand was those top 200. We just went through the list to like try it. There's details with the tickers that make it a pain. So we just matched by hand the top 200. Because for market cap, that's capturing, you know, a good chunk of the total market cap. And whether you do top 200 or not, um, I can actually, sh let me see if I, I have this graph. I can show it to you. Um, uh, Sorry, let me just pull this graph up because um, I can show you exactly what we do here. Um, so let me switch my screen share here. Uh, actually, I, I, I kind of feel like I should cut this off because yeah, we yeah. have a hard stop in eight minutes. Yes. Yeah, uh, no, good. So I'm. Um, we can talk about this after, but the short answer Perfect. is that it doesn't make a huge, uh, we like kind of, we check this and it doesn't make a huge difference. Um, Neil, thank you very much for uh, for keeping me on track. So, um, really, the I'm actually pretty happy with where I am on the time because we have there are two two more things I want to show you. The first is essentially building on what we what I just showed you, which is that instead of a correlation, I can just look at um, I can look at forecasting regression. So here, what I'm doing is I'm regressing some measure of real activity, call it unemployment, 
progress it on its own lag, cross-sectional uncertainty. And then there are two other controls I might include. One is cross-sectional realized dispersion. So realized file, not uncertainty. And two is market uncertainty, right? So I could ask, is it the market or is it the cross-sectional component that matters? So we do this first for unemployment. If I have just cross-sectional uncertainty, it shows up. Um, and it shows up in terms of units. What this says is that when uncertainty is one standard deviation higher, unemployment is going to rise by 0.1 standard deviations. So it's not a super strong relationship that corresponds to a correlation of 10%. If I include realized dispersion in that regression, it actually drives out cross-sectional uncertainty. So realized volatility, even though it's noisy, even though it looks much, much noisier, that gray line looks noisier than the black line, it actually has more forecasting power. And even though it's not good, it's not as good for forecasting future realized dispersion. And so that is not easy to square with a model where it's uncertainty that's actually driving things. And then third, I can control for market uncertainty. And if I do that, so this is just, again, S&P 500 IV, if I include that, that drives cross-sectional volatility out, cross-sectional uncertainty out of this regression. And so that tells us that this cross-sectional uncertainty does not have a, a super strong, um, a super strong relationship with the economy and it doesn't seem to be driving things. You can do the same for employment growth, same for IP growth, you find yourself in the same spot. Um, and so that, you know, the point of those regressions is that this cross-sectional implied volatility, it forecasts dispersion, it tells us that realized volatility is gonna be high, it's a measure of uncertainty, but it has mixed correlations with real activity and its forecasting power is, is delicate. It's not hard to drive it out. Um, I have a paper with Stefano and uh, David Berger uh, that's in Restud that makes this point more generally about the VIX, that also the VIX is driven out of forecasting regressions by market realized volatility. And so the point of that, um, I don't wanna to spend too long on this, but the point of that is that there is, these realized measures look noisy. That gray line looks noisy relative to the black line. And I think we often think about that, that the, the IV is an expectation, the realized volatility is the expectation plus noise. That noise contains information. That actually seems to be where the forecasting power is and not in the expectation itself. That's hard to get in models. That's hard to rationalize. And I think it's, it's very important to try to understand. So the last thing that we can do then is ask, I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna show you this in models and then very, very briefly show you this for Europe. So I can ask, do the models that we have, do the macro models that we have that are about uncertainty shocks, are they consistent with it? So, you know, the reason to try to measure things, the reason to construct these data series is to ask, um, you know, are our theories consistent with them? And I think, again, like kind of more broadly, I think finance has a lot to offer on this. When you uh, I'm going to guess there's not too many like macro macro people here. Macro macro people are, uh, you know, maybe not, they're not trained in finance, right? So there are like, the, there are things that we spend our days doing that we like did in school that we think very hard about, about how to measure stuff and about how to learn from asset prices. And I think that we have a lot to offer in terms of um, taking the tools that like, that, you know, that, that our, our forebears uh, I mean, including Torben, our forebears have developed in using them to ask uh, to ask questions about how the world works. And so, one of those questions is: is we can take these models of uncertainty shocks. Do they match what we see in the data? So, we're going to do two simple things. The first is is going really to Neil's question about persistence, which is I can look at the volatility of cross-sectional uncertainty, or I can look at its first autocorrelation. These are quarterly autocorrelations here. The volatility standard deviation relative to the mean is 0.3 in the data. This is a econometrica paper by Nick Bloom and co-authors. This is an AER by Larry Cristiano and co-authors. Their volatilities are both twice as big. They need huge movements in uncertainty that are far, far larger than what we see in the data in order to generate interesting effects in their models. Uh, Nick Bloom's work on um, these, these AR1s or the Nick Bloom's work on the Nick Bloom's paper is calibration. The correlation, the other correlation is essentially identical to what we see in the data. Cristiano Moto and Rustanio need much, much more persistence. And that's getting to this issue of what 
qualifies as persistent versus not. So I don't, you know, I don't know if you call 0.9 at a quarterly frequency persistent or not, but 0.98 is what you need often to get these business cycle frequency fluctuations. You need something that's that's really rather persistent. And that's just not consistent with what we see in the data. So that's number one. Number two, um, as we can ask, I can run these regressions. I can regress say GDP or consumption or investment on both lagged uncertainty, lagged realized dispersion. Realized dispersion drives uncertainty out in the data. You get the opposite in the model. It's uncertainty that is driving things in the model. Aggregate uncertainty drives out cross-sectional uncertainty in the data. Again, in the models, you get the opposite. It's that aggregate uncertainty in each case matters much, much more than cross-sectional uncertainty does. Or sorry, you have Aggregate's more important in the data, cross-sectional is more important in the model. Um, so I powered through that a bit. Um, the very last thing I want to show you, just because we have we have the data, all of this is available on our websites. Um, here I'm just showing you four, uh, wait, let me grab this. Let me answer this question actually after, since I'm going to hit my 60 minute limit. Um, we have data on cross-sectional uncertainty for four other countries. Um, it's on my website actually, I think for six, we also have Spain and the Netherlands. This kind of surprised me. The time series, which are the black lines for each of these countries, they're very similar to the US. The US is the dotted line. If you had told me that the market uncertainty in each of these countries was the same as the US, I would have believed that. I'm a lot more surprised that the cross-sectional uncertainty is so similar to the US. You get correlations of like 0 0.84, 0 0.84, 0 0.88, 0 0.7, but there's a there is some common factor, some common global factor, not just affecting aggregate shocks. It's not just that like all markets are exposed to some big shock or some US shock for that matter. It's that the cross section in each country, there is cross sectional dispersion that is moving around similarly across different countries. And that to me is really surprising and that I think is not, not terribly easy to, to build in some simple statistical model. So again, what we're trying to do in this paper is measure cross-sectional uncertainty. We went and got, um, we have data that's, you know, runs us back 16 years before what was available previously. The time series of that alone, I think is, is interesting in, its, in itself. I was, I was surprised by how it looks. It's kind of cyclical, it kind of moves with the business cycle, but not in a, in a consistent way. It is not terribly useful for forecasting. Um, we used to, again, the pricing, the pricing again, we dropped. In terms of implications, our claim is that cross-sectional uncertainty is not necessarily bad on its own. Sometimes it's good, right? You care about the underlying cause. In the late 90s, we had a lot of cross-sectional uncertainty because we didn't know which was the company that was going to do really well, right? You have all these tech stocks. They're all trying to do new stuff. Some of them are going to win and some are going to lose, and we don't know who the winner is going to be. And that then is going to create uncertainty, but that's not, it's not bad uncertainty. It's just uncertainty about how good things are going to be. In the financial crisis, it was which company is going to go bankrupt, right? And that's a much bigger problem. And so the point then is that, you know, maybe some types of uncertainty are bad. So this is where you get into the more recent work on good versus bad uncertainty. And, you know, one interpretation is that we're emphasizing that, that importance. Um, that does suggest that some, like, simple, like, just first pass type of model where all uncertainty shocks are bad, that is going to be misspecified and it's, it's going to miss it's gonna miss some things that we see in the data. Okay, so um, so thanks everybody for coming. Thank you very much for the questions. I think I'm allowed to keep going and answering questions. Um, yeah, so so right now, well, there is one question in the chat from Ing Ha Chung, but in addition to that, um, people should feel free to unmute themselves and ask their questions using the microphone if they want to. Uh, people were already doing it when they weren't supposed to, but they were well behaved, so we let it go. Um, yeah, no, they were very well behaved. I very much appreciate all the questions. Um, but anyway, can you see the question in the chat? Yes, I do. So, Ing, um, uh, so thank you. So, I, you're absolutely right that there's, um, we are only able to really get at, at one thing. I think there's a, you know, there are going to be models in which, uh, um, like firm specific uncertainty is going to translate into some like some cross-sectional dispersion in households but like certainly we're not measuring um, we're absolutely not measuring like a household level household level uncertainty and so I don't I 
we target, we kind of go after um, or like test uh, Bloom and, and Christiana's work very intentionally because those are about, about I think, things that map relatively well into what we're doing. Do you think, I mean, but do you think it relates to this? Sorry, my audio cut out just for a few seconds there, but do you think like your measure relates to this stuff? I mean, I know you're kind of targeting some of these other models, but. Uh, like in the sense, do I think it's correlated? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I actually think the answer is no. The reason I think the answer is no is that, uh, so I, actually, I have some work on this actually on like, um, on household level income risk. In my general sense of the of like where the literature stands on that, so like um, Amelia Road actually has one of the really important papers on this, just with Stuart Sutton and Tilmer. Um, a lot of that risk look, look, looks like it's from from um, unemployment shocks, right? That a huge amount of income risk. Like if you like, I mean, on some level for all of us, but really for a lot of people, the big risk that you face in your income is that you lose your job. Right, that like your income might go to zero. That like, and that's a lot of the driver of the variation in cross-sectional volatility of income over time. So that then, what that means is that you get this very, very strong correlation with uh, essentially unemployment claims, so with like layoffs. And those are almost the definition of the business cycle. And so you you see this like spectacularly strong relationship between um, cross-sectional dispersion in household income and uh, and the business cycle. Now, probably the right question would be like, you know, kind of going back to this issue of realized versus expected is how much of that is expected versus just that like a bunch of people get fired and then I see a big cross-sectional spread, but they didn't exactly know that was coming, right? If they, that like we didn't, right. the un, we didn't know unemployment was gonna go up. And so then, so I think there there is a question to be asked about realized versus expected for household stuff, but I think it's going inevitably going to be much, much more cyclical than what we have. Whereas what we have is, you know, again, I'm, my claim is that it's really not particularly cyclical. So really, can, sorry, uh, so really your measure is useful for a specific set of macro models. It's, yes, yeah, I think that's a very good way to say it, is that it's, it is, this is about like, I think like if, you're, if we're talking about like productivity shocks, I think that's the right way to think about this and like things that are affecting firms and this is not, um, this is not about the, uh, uh, it's not the right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Other right, questions? So can you, can, can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, so this really, really cool work. Um, I, uh, I learned a lot. I, I was wondering, so you, you probably have thought about this, but maybe you can help me think about this out loud. Uh, so it, Suppose you want, you deviate it slightly from the cap M world where kind of market is the only source of risk that's important. Suppose there's just one extra source of, of common risk, say value or whatever. Uh, what would you expect your results to look like if that was kind of the world? Like, would that explain er the, everything you find? Is there something in here that you, you would not be able to explain with this extra source of risk that is priced? Um, so I'm not sure whether, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure that pricing would matter. So that where that would show up is suppose there was some cross-sectional factor where like, so, you know, the, the key is that the, I mean, obviously once you've taken out the market, then the loadings on every other factor have to sum to zero just mechanically, like all those, because you've taken out like essentially like an, an eigenvector of a, or a vector of a bunch of ones. Uh, so every the loading the the value weighted average loading on any other factor has to add up to zero, but fluctuations in the volatility of that so in a size effect in a in a book to market effect in like industry effects, changes in the volatility of those things are absolutely going to show up in our in our measure, and that's the sense in which I mean that we have um, that like that's why I want to call it cross sectional uncertainty because it's any uncertainty about any of those things is going to to appear in what we're measuring. Um, and then, and you know, I'm, I'm okay with, I'm okay, I, so that just is what it is. On some level, what this is saying is that that thing, we're describing how those things fluctuate over time. I don't know. 
Yeah, tell me if that answered your question. It, it would help me uh, personally, like if you could kind of walk me through and maybe your reader is going to walk me through, suppose that there's this other source of risk. Uh, this is how I expect it to show up in my measure. Um, and maybe it completely offsets because you're, taking, you're looking usually at long short portfolios. Um, no, so the way it's going to show up is that not. as the, the variant, so suppose there are two factors. Suppose there's a market factor and there's a cross-sectional factor. And that's it. And then there's like, the, and there's epsilons. So you have like two factors and an epsilon. Yeah. The, what you're going to get is that the, our measure, our sigma, or our sigma squared, is going to be the sum of the squared loadings on that second factor times the conditional variance of that second factor plus the average conditional variance of the epsilons. And so you can then get what we're calling cross-sectional uncertainty can be driven by two things. It can be driven by movements in the variance of that cross-sectional factor and by movements in the epsilons themselves. And uh, I do think that there are gonna be models where you might interpret those things differently. That's, that's entirely possible. Uh, one of the things that we try to do to deal with that a little bit is we do we can pull out industry effects, and so that that would be one kind of cross-sectional factor. Um, we haven't done anything to try to pull out like book to market or anything like that. Okay. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more question. No other questions. Great. Then, then thanks very much, Ian. It was great. Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, guys, for uh, putting me on the program. I enjoyed it. I really appreciated it. Uh, and this will, I think this will make the paper uh, much, much better. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for having joined us today. Uh, if you want to send the slides to your colleague, they are going to be on virtualderivatives.org. We also have a YouTube channel on which uh, Ian is going to become a star. And uh, if you want to hang around and have some FaceTime with Ian, uh, you can, of course, stay with us. Uh, for the next few minutes. Otherwise, I wish you a very happy Canada Day today and uh, uh, Independence Day.